This is the last in this series of 12 videos looking at quantum entanglement. The first nine of them dealt with the physics and mathematics of the issue in order to gain some appreciation of the difference between what we might call classical entanglement and the entanglement which can take place between electrons. We looked at enough of the theory of quantum mechanics and at some of the experimental evidence for us to realize that either something very strange is going on between two entangled particles in that they seem magically to communicate with one another or they have a lot of information hidden within them to tell them what to do in every circumstance, the so-called hidden variables. In the last two videos, we've looked at Bell's inequality, which points to experiments to try and dismiss this idea of hidden variables. And we've transitioned our thinking from focusing on the entangled states of electrons to those of photons, in order that such experiments can be investigated. We should now therefore be in a position to think about what we might call a Bell test in order to try and decide if hidden variable theory can explain the reality of how particles behave. If it has to be discarded as a theory, then the best contender for the explanation of the physics of the very small, as supported by the current consensus of physicists, is quantum mechanics. Let's check it out. There are many different kinds of Bell tests that could be considered even while still keeping things as simple as possible and ignoring some of the many subtleties of the apparatus and leaving out any extra procedures that might be needed to minimize errors that can arise. I want to try and steer a simple course through a, a rather idealistic experiment in such a way that the logic and quantum mechanics underlying it can be appreciated. It should then be clearly seen that the result will contradict the idea of hidden variables and confirm the possibility of the weirdness of quantum mechanics. The basic line of attack in most experiments or Bell tests is to start with a pair of entangled photons, A and B. Let's say that from now on we will be considering entangled photons each with the same direction of polarization, coming from some kind of source, which we'll call S. I could have chosen to have a source which produced photon pairs with polarizations at right angles, but in what follows, I shall always be considering entangled photons with the same direction of polarization. In other words, the state vector of the entangled pair could be written in this form, and many others like it, where the directions in this bit are the same as one another, but at right angles to those in this bit. Here are some of the many different ways of writing what amounts to the same thing, which is the state of two entangled photons where they each have the same direction of polarization, even though we can't say what that direction is. Obviously, from what we discussed in the last video, if we're going to get pairs of photons like this, then they can't be from anything like the decay of neutral pions, even if we could find a way of getting enough because those entangled photons would have their polarization at right angles to one another. One way to get a source of entangled photons with the same polarization direction is to use the phenomenon of spontaneous parametric down conversion. Now we could spend far too much time going through the detail of this, so I will only give a very brief description. Certain nonlinear crystals cut in certain ways and may be sandwiched with other crystals cut in certain ways. Does that sound vague enough? These crystals have some strange properties when light is passed through them. They are known as spontaneous parametric down converters, SPDC. The crystal material can sometimes be beta barium borate or potassium dihydrogen phosphate. Essentially, if an intense laser beam is sent into the crystal setup, then some of the photons in the beam will be converted into two photons with half the energy and will come out in two separate beams as entangled photons a small angle apart, smaller than is shown here. In the experiments that we're concerned with, the input beam, known as the pump laser, will be in the ultraviolet around 405 nanometers in wavelength and the two exiting beams known as the signal and the idler will be in the infrared at twice that wavelength which means half the frequency and hence half the energy of the pump. 
energy and momentum are each conserved in this down conversion and one can easily write down the appropriate equations a scalar addition for energy and a vector addition for linear momentum as far as the conservation of angular momentum is concerned that's another matter and you'll need to explore the theory of spontaneous parametric down conversion to be comfortable with that similarly further study in that direction will help you see the actual process whereby one photon can be thought of as becoming two we won't go anywhere near the details of spdc which are complex but depending on a number of factors including the makeup of the nonlinear crystal and whether the incoming beam is itself polarized you can either obtain pairs of entangled photons where the polarizations are at 90 degrees to each other or with a different setup you can get pairs of entangled photons with polarizations which are in the same direction as each other in both cases however the efficiency of the process is extremely low most of the pump photons pass straight through the crystal and often only about one in a trillion undergo conversion that's one in 10 to the 12. the pump therefore needs to be a fairly intense laser beam even to produce a modest number of entangled pairs per second anyway suffice to say it is possible to create a useful source of pairs of entangled photons which when guided by optical apparatus could end up traveling in opposite directions if we wanted them to so let's imagine that we have pairs of entangled photons a and b being emitted from our source s traveling in opposite directions as in this schematic diagram we'll also assume that each pair of photons will have the same direction of polarization even though that direction because of entanglement is undefined then if photon a is measured using a vertical filter in order to see if the photon passes through it and if it does pass through then we can say that the polarization of a is now definitely in the vertical direction at that instant according to quantum mechanics the wave function or the state vector of the pair collapses and the b photon must also then be vertically polarized that means that if b is then measured using another vertical filter the b photon will definitely pass through it that is i hope by now obvious to us from what we know about quantum mechanics before measurement the entangled photons had this as their state vector the polarization of a was then measured and it was found as we said to be vertical that means that this part of the state vector cannot be possible and so the whole thing collapsed to v a v b if the b photon is then measured with a filter in the vertical direction it will definitely go through and be measured as being vertical if we hadn't yet discarded the idea of hidden variables then the question could remain of course is it really true that photon a is somehow connected to photon b and that it sends some kind of an instantaneous message to b telling it to be vertically polarized so that the state vector collapses or did they both know all along what to do did they have some hidden variables or carry some hidden data with them with information as to what to do for every angle to be measured in particular for this case what to do if they were presented with a vertical filter like this that's the kind of question these experiments will be asking but before we get to an experiment let me imagine another similar scenario once again we'll assume we have two entangled photons a and b from a source known to produce photon pairs with identical though undefined polarization direction quantum mechanics would say the state vector is as we had before one over root two v a v b plus h a h b imagine again that photon a is measured using a vertical filter in other words a vertical filter is put in its path and suppose like before the photon passes through once again we can say that a is definitely polarized in the vertical direction and once again of course according to quantum mechanics and also according to hidden variable theory as well the b photon must also be vertically polarized because we know that it will definitely pass through a vertical filter because it should have the same hidden variables as a imagine however that we then use a second filter to measure the polarization of the b photon in a different direction at some angle theta to the vertical 
will this photon get through the filter? Well, it might. Quantum mechanics predicts a probability of cos squared theta that it will get through. Hidden variable theory, well, what might that predict? And within that question lies the kernel of the Bell test. By changing the angles, perhaps of both filters, and seeing what gets through for different pairs of entangled photons, we can look for differences between what quantum mechanics predicts, with all its focus on probability and cos squared theta, and what hidden variable theory predicts, with all its focus on definiteness because of the belief that the photon has the information encoded within it from the start. We'll have to be careful about angles and stipulate what the hidden variables might be for those angles, but we should be able to compare what we'd expect from quantum mechanics and what we'd expect from hidden variables. Changing the angles of the filter will be the key to a Bell test that may help us decide between hidden variables and quantum mechanics as to the better explanation of what's going on. A number of Bell tests work in this kind of way. The source sends out pairs of entangled photons, entangled so that their polarizations are in the same direction, though of course no specific direction in space is involved. Each one of the pair of photons is passed through its own polarization filter, angled at a known but randomly different angle each time. Perhaps I should show the photons a little blurred to illustrate that their polarizations could be in any direction before they're measured, even though they are the same as one another. The experiment that I'm going to describe here is not an actual experiment. I've chosen a very simplified version so that I can explain the physics behind it and the analysis of the results more easily. Once we get through this, I'll hint at other more realistic experimental procedures, along with some of their subtleties, the apparatus they use, and perhaps procedures that might be needed to minimize errors. Anyway, back to this rather simplistic experiment. If the photons get through their respective angled filter, they are each detected by a photon detector called a Single Photon Avalanche Diode, or SPAD. And I've shown the photon detector for A in amber and that for B in blue. When a photon is detected in these, a pulse signal from each is sent to some counting devices via logic gates. For example, an OR gate on the two signals can have its output sent to a counter, which can be used to record the number of photons that get through one or both of the filters A and B. This will count the number of times either one of the photons in each of the entangled pair gets through their respective filter. Similarly, an AND gate on the two signals can have its output sent to another counter, which will then record the number of times both filters, A and B, allow photons to pass through them. This will count the number of times that both photons from the entangled pairs get through the filters. The procedure of this simplified experiment consists of changing the angles of the polarization filters and leaving the two counters to accumulate results for this setting as the pairs of photons are randomly produced. Obviously the number counted on what I'm calling the event counter will be greater than the number counted on what I'm calling the coincidence counter. The event counter relates to when either one of the pair of entangled photons passes through its filter and is counted, whereas the coincidence counter relates to when both photons from an entangled pair get through their filters and are counted. As we'll see in a moment from the theories, the coincidences for quantum mechanics are expected to be different to those for a theory which assumes hidden variables, and hence this test is able, to some extent at least, to distinguish between the two theories. So, that's a possible setup of the apparatus to test the hidden variable model, at least in a form that is amenable to a fairly simple explanation. To see how this would work out, we need first to decide on what angles to choose for the filters, and then we'll look at how the hidden variable results should differ from quantum mechanics results, simply from the theory. Rather like we did when thinking about electrons and their spin, and coloured socks, 
we will take three distinct angles for the two polarization filters but this time instead of 0 45 and 90 degrees we'll take 0 120 and 240 degrees this diagram shows one of the filters at each of the three angles that will be used and they're here shown with a black blob on the top edge of the filter and a dotted line down the center so that the different orientations can be appreciated maybe this logo helps as well to see that the angles here are indeed 0 120 and 240 degrees the values of the three angles don't have to be 0 120 and 240 and I've chosen them simply for convenience of discussing the theory. Each of the two polarization filters, A and B, will be angled at these three angles and they'll be changed from one angle to another at random. They will not, however, be allowed to be the same angle for filters A and B because if you think about it, the results from that would be trivial and would simply dilute any difference between the two models. If you can't yet see that, think about it. If photon A went through this vertical filter, it would mean that the photon was vertically polarized. But being entangled, that means photon B must also be vertically polarized and it must also go through a vertical filter. Similarly, if photon A didn't go through this vertical filter, then A must be horizontally polarized. But that would also mean that photon B would also have to be horizontally polarized, and so it would not go through its vertical filter. The same argument applies to the hidden variable theory. If one photon had the information telling it to go through a particular fi filter, then so must the other have exactly the same information. For that reason, only different orientations of filters will be used in the otherwise random choosing of directions of filters for A and B equal angle filters will not be used. It should also be obvious that because polarization is, in a sense, a bi-directional thing, these three positions of the filter that we're going to use could be said to be at 60 degrees to each other. There's zero, go clockwise through 120, and the two lines could also be said to be 60 degrees apart. Similarly, at the other pair of the two angles, for example, there's 120 degrees to the vertical, go clockwise to 240, and the two directions could be said to be 60 degrees apart. Now, I realize that's trivial, but that idea of the 60 degrees difference will come in later when we do calculations from quantum mechanics. But for now, let's just talk in terms of the three filter angles which we'll use in our experiment as being 0, 120 degrees and 240 degrees. Let me first try and calculate the expected results from our hidden variable theory. In other words, what would be the likely results of an experiment in terms of the numbers of events and coincidences if hidden variables are responsible for the consequences of randomly changing the angles between those values of 0, 120 and 240 degrees. It may sound complicated, but it really isn't. Now, even though a complete hidden variable model might really need each photon in a pair to have coded information about every conceivable angle from 0 to 360, we are only going to be looking at three directions. So we only need to consider three hidden variables. These will contain the information that tells the photon what to do if it's measured at zero degrees, what it should do if it's measured at 120 degrees, and what it should do if it's measured at 240 degrees. And in this case, the two photons get the same information. Let me start a table, a bit like we did for the socks and the electrons in an earlier video. And you should start to see what I mean. Here are the three angles of the filters. In the hidden variable model, the photons are going to need to know three pieces of information. What to do if they have their polarization measured at any one of those angles? Should they go through a zero degree filter? Yes or no. Should they go through a 120 degree filter? Yes or no. And should they go through a 240 degree filter? Yes or no. In fact, I shall use Y and N for yes and no, you'll see what I mean in a minute. You've probably realized by now, because we've seen this all before, that when you have three possible angles, you need eight possible ways in which information about the three angles can be coded. Let me fill the table in, and then I'll explain. 
It looks a bit like counting in binary where n is 0 and y is 1. 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, and so on, right up to 1, 1, 1. First look at this row. The explanation is that if an entangled pair of photons each contain a hidden code n, 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 then they will not pass through any filter which has been set at 0, 120, or 240 degrees. Next, if the pair of photons each contain the code n, n, y, then neither of them must pass through the 0 or 120 degrees filter, but they must pass through a filter set at 240 degrees. If they contain the hidden code NYN, then the only filter they can and must pass through is the one set at 120 degrees. And so on, until finally, if both cut photons contain this last hidden variable, or coded data YYY, it would mean that if they encounter a filter in any of the angles, 0, 120 or 240 degrees, they must pass through. It should be fairly obvious that because we are only considering three different angles to be measured, then there are only these eight possible sets of hidden variables in this model. And each of the two entangled photons in a pair must contain the same one of these codes. OK, so we now need to extend our table to predict how many events and coincidences this three-angle hidden variable model is likely to give. This will give us the predictions for the hidden variable model. Here are the columns I'm going to use. Obviously, such an experiment would run for a long time, and we would hope that we'd have lots of entangled pairs of photons going through filters set at lots of random angles. If it ran for long enough, we would probably assume that each of the eight sets of hidden variable values have been used equally and a large number of times. We would also assume that because it ran for so long, each pair of photons with any hidden variables met filters at all different angles many times over. There would be a kind of randomness to all of this. However, for this exercise of predicting the results that the hidden variable model might give, we'll consider for simplicity just 24 pairs of entangled photons altogether. Of those, three pairs will have this code, NNN. And one of those entangled pairs will meet the filters set at 0 and 120 degrees. One pair will meet them set at 0 and 240 degrees. And the third entangled pair will meet filters set at 120 and 240 degrees. We'll also assume we have three pairs of entangled photons with this code, NNY. And again, one of those pairs will meet the filters set at 0 and 120 degrees. One pair will meet them set at 0 and 240. And the third pair will meet the filters set at 120 and 240 degrees. Similarly for this code, and so on. There will be three pairs of entangled photons for each code. The first entangled pair of those three will meet the filters set at 0 and 120. The second pair will meet the filters set at 0 and 240. And the third pair will meet the filters set at 120 and 240. In an actual experiment, of course, as I said, we would hope to have thousands of pairs of photons. And the hidden variables, if the model were true, would be random. But hopefully they'd be equally spread out. However, in order to analyse the likely result here, we'll just consider these 24 entangled pairs, equally shared out in the table. Three pairs for each row, and one pair for each of the th entries on the right-hand side. You'll see what I mean as we work through things. OK. With the first three coded pairs, each coded with n, 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 we'll assume that one pair meets the filters set at 0 and 120, another pair meets the filters set at 0 and 240, and the third pair meets the filters set at 120 and 240 degrees. You can probably see why I want 24 pairs of entangled photons altogether, so that I have an equal occurrence of everything. Hopefully that's what would happen in practice with thousands of random hidden variables and random angles. But anyway, let's go through the table and see what the hidden variable theory predicts in this case with the 24. What would a pair of photons with NNN data do? Well, neither of the pair is going to go through either filter, whatever the angles, so there'd be no events anywhere and no coincidences anywhere either. 
So I'll put dashes in to illustrate that. What we're saying here is, according to the hidden variable model, my three pairs of photons with n, n, n will give no photons through either filter, whether the two filters are set at 0, 0,120, 0, 0,240, or 120, 240. And so nothing will register in the event counter or on the coincidence counter. OK, so what about photons with the next coding, n, n, y? Well, this coding says that only if a filter is at 240 degrees can a photon get through. Consequently, if the filters are set at 0, 0,120, then photons are not allowed through. Dashes again there. With the photons set at 0 and 240, the photon going to the 240 degree filter will get through. So we'll have an event from the OR gate but the other photon won't get through the zero degree filter, so there's no coincidence. Similarly, if the filters are set at 120 and 240, only the one going to the 240 degree filter will get through. Again, we have an event, but no coincidence. E, but no C. The same is true for the next row of the table. This time we'll get an event whenever one of the pair of filters is at 120 degrees, but there won't be any coincidences at all. However, row number four is more interesting. It has two yeses in it, so that of the three entangled pairs of photons that have this code, one of those pairs should give us a coincidence, the one with both filters at, at the appropriate angles. Working through the logic, we can say that if the filters are at 0 and 120, then the photon going to the 120 degree filter will get through, but not the other one. That's another event, but no coincidence. The same is true for the filters set at the angle 0 and 240 degrees. An event from the 240 degrees this time, but still no coincidence. However, because the two photons have hidden variables with yeses in these columns, then when the filters are set at 120 and 240 degrees, then both photons must go through their filters. In this case, we would get, according to the hidden variable model, an event from the OR gate and also a coincidence from the AND gate, which will register on our counters. E and C can go in the table. Following this kind of logic, we can work down the table and we will get these results. Obviously, when the photons each have the last hidden variable, y, 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 they both go through any of the three filter directions, and so we get events and coincidences, whatever the pair of angles. Now, from this completed table, we can work out the ratio of coincidences to events that we'd expect to get from photons which have hidden variables in them. And this can later be compared with the predictions of quantum mechanics. Counting up the numbers of E's and C's in the table, there are 18 events and 6 of them have coincidences. So, of the 24 entangled pairs that were considered here, the hidden variable model predicts that the event counter should register 18 and the coincidence counter should register 6. This means that the hidden variable model predicts that with this random selecting of filter angles, the probability of getting both counters to register, coincidence, whenever one counter registers, is 6 over 18, or one third. As I suggested earlier, if this simple experiment could be done, there would hopefully be thousands of events with random hidden variables, and with the pairs of angles 0, 120, 0, 240, or 120, 240. Those angles would be selected at random, with equal time spent counting for each pair of angles. In this way, with large enough numbers, it would then be assumed that the large numbers in the event counter and in the coincidence counter would be representative of the situation that we had here with just 24 pairs of photons, with everything nicely evenly distributed throughout. Our assumption, therefore, would be that if the hidden variable model could be considered to be true, then the experimental results would have to give the ratio of coincidences to events to be approximately one-third. 
OK, so that's the hidden variable prediction for an experiment like this. What about quantum mechanics? What would that predict for an experiment performed in this way? The experiment is exactly the same. Entangled pairs, filters and angles, but we're now going to work out the results that quantum mechanics would predict. In particular, we're going to work out the ratio of coincidences to events which quantum mechanics would predict and then see how it compares to the value of one third that the hidden variable model predicts. We won't need a table for this. We should be able simply to think through the probabilities involved. We said before that for the angles of 0, 120 and 240 degrees, any pair of angles are effectively 60 degrees apart. So that means that as far as quantum mechanics is concerned, every entangled pair of photons meets filters that are 60 degrees apart. That's all the information we need to know. We don't need to think about 0, 120, 0, 240 or 120, 240 because each of these situations means the filters are 60 degrees different. We can say that for every situation the first photon meets a filter and the second one meets a filter at 60 degrees to the first. We'll think through the possibilities and probabilities for just one pair of entangled photons and that will be enough. We will then get the answer we need. Let's imagine then that an entangled pair of photons with identical polarization directions are heading towards filters A and B. The angles of the filters are 60 degrees different to one another. Again, it should be obvious that even though the distances to the filters might be about the same for A and B, one of the photons will reach its filter first. I'm going to assume it's A for the sake of argument. Will this entangled photon go through the A filter? What is the probability? Well, thinking quantum mechanically, you should recall that an entangled photon has no definite polarization direction. The state vector for the pair of entangled photons is given by this. Vertical vertical plus horizontal horizontal, which can be written in arrow form like this. In fact, anything goes in writing this state as long as these two are the same direction and perpendicular to these two, which are also then in the same direction. For instance, this would do, or this, or in fact anything like this that has angles in the first ket that are equal to one another, but perpendicular to those in the second ket. These expressions are all equivalent mathematically, and don't forget the perpendicular seen here has nothing to do with the polarization being perpendicular. The polarizations of the two photons are the same. It's just that we don't know whether they are this way or that, or this way, or that, or whatever. As far as quantum mechanics is concerned, they can both be pictured like this coming out of the screen before measurement takes place. Anyway, the 1 over root 2 in all these equations means that there is a 50% probability, 1 over root 2 squared, of any entangled photon going through a filter set at any angle. And it turns out that this figure of 50% won't come initially into our calculations. It may be needed in some experiments, but as we are looking here only at events and coincidences of events, we won't need to use it. Let's suppose that this first photon A meets filter A and with its 50-50 chance of getting through, actually does get through. In that case, we get an event registered on the event counter. The next question to ask is, what is the probability that the second photon, the B photon, will also get through its filter and we then get a coincidence as well? Well, we know that if the first photon gets through its filter, the event, then the second photon must have the same polarization direction as the first. That is true in both the hidden variable theory and in quantum mechanics. In quantum mechanics, it's because the wave function or state vector collapses to become definitely one of the relevant kets. In this situation, it would be this one. This, of course, means that the polarization of the B photon must also be vertical. It has the same polarization as the A photon. 
Consequently, when, a very short time later, this B photon meets its filter, it must meet it at 60 degrees. That should be obvious. Filters are 60 degrees different to one another. The A photon went through its filter, so the polarization of the A photon is in the direction of that filter. The B photon now definitely has a polarization in the direction of the A filter. It then meets the B filter at 60 degrees to that. In other words, if the A photon goes through its filter, then the B photon must have its polarization direction at 60 degrees to its filter. Now the probability that a photon will go through a filter at 60 degrees to its axis of polarization is given by cos squared 60. We got that from quantum mechanics. Cos 60 is a half, which means that cos squared 60 is a quarter. The probability is therefore a quarter. If it gets through, of course, it will essentially then be a photon with polarization at 60 degrees, but we're not concerned with that here. We're simply interested in the fact that it got through and would be counted. So, what we've just said must be true for half of all the photon pairs. Because we said that from the form of the state vector, that 50% of A photons will get through the first filter. Of those 50% of the pairs of entangled photons, we've just found that a quarter of B photons will also get through the second filter. So hold that thought. But what about the other half of the entangled pairs? What about the photons that do not get through the first A filter? Well, not getting through is still a measurement, in the sense that it tells us that the polarization of the A photon has been measured to be at right angles to filter A. That's why it didn't get through. That means, of course, according to quantum mechanics, that the second photon, B, is also at 90 degrees to the first filter, the A filter, like this. If you think about it, that means that the second photon, B, is therefore at 30 degrees to the second filter, the B filter, when it meets it. What is the probability that this photon will get through its B filter? Once again, of course, this is given by the cos squared of the angle. Cos 30 is root 3 over 2, so cos squared 30 is 3 quarters. This means that the probability of B going through if A doesn't go through is 0.75. And if this happens, it will constitute another event created by the passing of a photon only through the B filter. So what is quantum mechanics saying for the predictions of events and coincidences altogether? It's saying these four things. Half the entangled photons go through the first filter, I'll call it A, and give events. Of their partner photons B, 0.25 of them get through their filter and give coincidences. The other half of the photons which don't go through A give us no data, no counts. However, of the partner photons, B of those, 0.75 of them get through filter B and give events. Now, we want to know the ratio of coincidences to events in order to compare this quantum mechanics prediction with the hidden variable model. It might be best to put some numbers into the quantum mechanics probabilities in order to see what's going on. Rather than assuming just 24 entangled pairs like before, let me, for convenience, suppose that we had 200 entangled pairs, that's 400 photons altogether, and we'll assume that once again, it wouldn't matter, that the photon on the A branch reaches the A filter first. Of the 200 photons reaching the A filter, 100 will go through at 50%, giving us 100 events registered. Once this is measured, we said that it means that the photon in the B branch must also have its polarization in the direction of the A filter. So when those 100 reach the B filter, they will be at 60 degrees to it. The probability of them going through the filter, we said, will be cos squared 60, which is a quarter. This means that 25 of these 100 B photons will get through the B filter and will therefore register as coincidences because the A photon already registered an event. So far then, 
we would have 100 events, 25 of which are also coincidences. That was for the 50% of photons that got through the A filter. But what about the other 100, the other 50%? These don't go through the A filter, and that means that their polarization must be at 90 degrees to it. That also means that the 100 B photons from these entangled pairs must have the same polarization as the A, namely at 90 degrees to the A filter. But the filters are 60 degrees different, we said, so this means that the B photons have their polarizations at 30 degrees to the B filter. The probability of them getting through the B filter will be cos squared 30, which we said is 3 quarters. This means 75 of these 100 B photons will get through the B filter and will register as events. Let me tally all the events and coincidences that quantum mechanics predicts for these 200 entangled pairs of photons. When the A photon gets through its filter, we get 100 events and 25 coincidences. When the A photon doesn't get through its filter, we get 75 events and no coincidences. So, according to quantum mechanics, from these 200 entangled photon pairs, we would get a total of 175 events, and of these, 25 would also register as coincidences. And this means that the ratio of coincidences to events is 25 over 175, which is a seventh, 0.143. We can now compare what the hidden variable model and quantum mechanics predict for the ratio of coincidences to events. Hidden variables predicts a ratio of a third. Quantum mechanics predicts a ratio of one seventh. Clearly these results are very distinctive. And it won't surprise you to learn that if the experiment were to be done without the inevitable experimental problems, the result would favour the quantum mechanical model with an answer close to one seventh. In other words, with a reasonably large rate of entangled pairs of photons, and with equal time spent with the two filters set at 0, 120 and 240 degrees, but never the same angles as each other, and with other experimental issues ironed out, then the results for the ratio of coincidences to events would tend towards one seventh rather than one third, thus discrediting the hidden variable model. It would favour the quantum mechanics explanation of entanglement, whereby when the polarisation direction of one particle of an entangled pair is measured, then the polarisation direction of the other particle gets fixed at its value. In the case of these photons, they would have the same polarization. But in the case of the entangled pairs of electrons that we considered very early on, they would have opposite spin directions. What this experiment does not necessarily show is that any so-called communication between the entangled particles which gives this collapse of the state vector is instantaneous, or even simply faster than the speed of light. In principle, at least, someone could object and say that there could be some as yet unknown method of communication, some kind of unknown type of wave traveling at or less than the speed of light, whereby photon A, which is first measured, tells photon B what polarization direction it must have. One way, of course, to eliminate this explanation is to make the branches of the experiment extra long. So instead of this, we would have this. Here the paths of the photons are shown with dotted lines to imply their great length and it's presumed that time delays in counting could be adjusted for. Assuming again however that A is measured first because of a slight difference in the paths, the distance from A to the B is now too long for a message even at the speed of light to get from A to B before B is detected by the B filter. The fact that such an experiment would still give the same result of around one seventh for the ratio of coincidences to events means that any so-called communication from A to B on collapse of the state vector must be, if not instantaneous, at least faster than the speed of light. 
I believe that most physicists generally assume that it is instantaneous and that the state vector for the entangled pair is a kind of single entity. When one part of it is measured, say A, then the other part, B, is instantaneously affected. You may remember that early on we pictured this for two entangled electrons with a line between them and a similar kind of picture for two entangled photons coming out of the screen might be like this. You can see from this picture that they have no definite direction of polarization while they are entangled. However, if photon A is detected and the polarization is measured and found, say, to be vertical, then at that instant the polarization of photon B is fixed at being vertical also. Of course, if you then measure the polarization of B using a filter at some different angle to the vertical, then you cannot be sure what you will get. The probability will go as cos squared theta. But if you did measure it in the vertical direction, you will definitely get 100% the answer that it is vertical. It will go through the vertical filter. I should say at this stage that Bell tests do not prove that the quantum mechanical explanation is the correct one. There could be other explanations or theories that we don't know about yet. All we can say from experiments of this type is that hidden variable theory does not explain what is going on and that quantum mechanics does despite its weirdness. We can even say that if quantum mechanics is correct and we imagine that there is communication between the entangled particles once one is measured, then that communication must be faster than the speed of light and is probably instantaneous. Right, having said earlier that the Bell experiment that I've just described was somewhat contrived, I feel I ought to mention details of some actual Bell tests which use entangled photons. Bear in mind that if you want to get into this more seriously, you need to get to grips with a good deal more optics in order to feel comfortable with it. Here, I will go through some of the experimental details applicable to some experiments, although I shall skip the sometimes involved detail of the actual Bell inequality and how the results are analysed. That was the whole point of the contrived experiment earlier, to illustrate the principles involved. OK, so what about some real experiments? As you can probably imagine from what little we've discussed, there are a good number of different types of Bell inequalities. The very term Bell inequality can mean any number of expressions which satisfy local hidden variable theory. As we've seen in one example, these inequalities place restrictions on what you might expect the results from certain experiments on entangled particles to be. The term Bell test can be used to describe any experiment that relates to some local situation in the real world. It's concerned with testing whether, in a small portion of space, what goes on can be explained simply by the things that are there. In other words, the properties of the particles in that space, etc. The experiment tests whether all the information can be in the particles, maybe in the form of hidden variables or hidden data. If the test fails, then there is the possibility that what happens in that local region of real space can be affected by what happens somewhere else, maybe on the other side of the universe, and it can be affected instantaneously. In that sense, a Bell test inve investigates what might be called local realism, as opposed to a situation whereby local space can be affected instantaneously by something that's not local, but happens some distance away. Real Bell test experiments can get very sophisticated indeed, but generally they involve looking at the kind of coincidences that we've already been thinking about. Let me briefly consider some of those more realistic Bell tests. Once again, we'll consider entangled photons whose polarization will be analyzed using some kind of filters as analyzers. However, since 1982, when Alan Aspect did his famous Bell test experiment, 
the analyzers used in most Bell tests have not been a simple polarizing filter of the type that we looked at earlier. You could say that analyzers like these have only a single output channel in the sense that the photon either gets through the filter or it doesn't, one way in and one way out. And you don't do anything with the photons that don't get through. You can't do anything. They're lost in the experiment. Real Bell test experiments tend to use analyzers that are designated as having two output channels, one way in and two ways out. With these, in a sense, you do get to do things with the photons that uh, don't get through. Well, you'll see what I mean in a minute. The name given to these analyzers are polarizing beam splitters, and here's a schematic illustration of what they're about. I've drawn this as a cube with a kind of diagonal boundary inside it. In fact, such things are usually made up from gluing together two right-angled prisms, one of which has a dielectric beam splitting coating on the hypotenuse. That's the grayed area that you can see here. With this kind of filter, if a vertically polarized photon enters the polarizing beam splitter from the left, it will pass straight through the filter. If, however, a horizontally polarized photon enters from the left, it will be reflected by 90 degrees and go downwards. This means that if both photons entered from the left, they would be separated according to their polarization. They would be split up. If a photon with polarization at 45 degrees to the vertical were to enter the polarizing beam splitter from the left, then quantum mechanics would predict by cos squared 45 that there's a 50-50 chance of it going straight through or being reflected downwards. I'm sure also that you realize that if an unpolarized beam of light with photons at all different angles of polarization were to enter the filter, then half would go straight through and half would be reflected downwards. Finally, it should also be obvious by now, if you think about it, that if an entangled photon, which effectively has no definitive direction of polarization, were to strike the polarizing beam splitter from the left, it will have a 50% chance of being detected as a vertically polarized photon and a 50% chance of being detected as a horizontally polarized photon. Consequently, it has a 50% chance of passing straight through this cube and ending up with vertical polarization and a 50% chance of being reflected by 90 degrees and ending up with horizontal polarization. Consequently, with a steady stream of entangled photons coming in from the left, half of them will go straight through and hence be vertically polarized and half will be deflected downwards and be horizontally polarized. The name given to the kind of experiment which uses this type of two-channel filters is called a CHSH experiment. The letters CHSH stand for four researchers, Klaus Horn, Schemini and Holt, who in 1969 derived a particular inequality which, like Bell's, can be used to test the idea of hidden variables. I don't propose to go into much detail of the mathematics of this inequality, but a typical CHSH experiment can be represented like this. Let me talk through what goes on. The source spits out pairs of entangled photons A and B in the two directions. The two photons in any pair have, strictly speaking, no definitive polarization direction. And that's why they're shown here a little fuzzy. On the other hand, they must have the same polarization direction as one another because they are entangled in that way. As the photons travel outwards, either photon A or photon B will reach its polarizing beam splitter first, whichever is the nearer. Let's say once again that it is A. Once the A photon reaches its splitter, it will have its polarization direction measured. And by quantum mechanics, it has a 50-50 chance of being horizontal or vertical. 
Of course, by the hidden variable model, it would have that information embedded in it and would know whether it was to be considered horizontal or vertical. If it's measured as vertical, the A photon will go straight through the polarizing beam splitter and into the detector A+. On the other hand, if it's measured as horizontal, it will reflect down to the photon detector A-. Whichever one it is, one or other of these electronic pulses will be sent to the coincidence monitor, a box of electronics that will count various things. Once photon A has been measured in that way, photon B will then, according to quantum mechanics, have a definite polarization. The state vector of the entangled pair will have collapsed, and in this case we can say that photon B must have the same polarization as that of A. Once again, in the hidden variable model, that information would already be embedded in it. Looking at this diagram and the way it's currently drawn, if we know the polarization of the A photon and which way it went, we can say that the B photon will go the same way. In other words, if A is vertical and goes straight on, then B must also be vertical and go straight on, and so on. However, that assumes that both polarizing beam splitters are set at the same angle. And in the experiment, that will not be the case. In the experiment, the polarizing beam splitter for B will actually be rotated at some angle to that of A. And so it's not immediately obvious what will happen next. In the hidden variable model, what happens next will depend on the values of the hidden variables that this particular pair of entangled photons had, and whether for the angle of this B splitter, the photon goes straight on or gets sent downwards. In the quantum mechanical model, it will be a question of probability, consistent with the rules of quantum mechanics as to whether a photon goes straight on or is turned downwards. For either model, however, if the B photon goes straight on, it will go through to detector B+, plus, and the pulse will go to the coincidence monitor via this route. Alternatively, if the photon gets sent downwards, it will go to detector B-, minus, which will send a pulse to the coincidence monitor via this connection. As you can see from the face of the coincidence monitor here, which is a multiple counter, this box of electronics will be programmed to count four things. The number of coincidences of A plus and B plus, which we could simply call plus plus. The number of coincidences of A plus and B minus, or plus minus. The number of coincidences of A minus and B plus, which is minus plus. And the number of coincidences of A minus and B minus, which is minus minus. The experiment with these four measurements is actually done four times with different angles for the polarizing beam splitters. These four separate experiments are performed with each of the beam splitters set at the following different angles. 0 and 22.5, 0 and 67.5, 45 degrees and 22.5 degrees, and 45 degrees and 67.5 degrees. These may seem rather strange angles, but they're chosen because they give the greatest violation of the inequality in this case, and they are sometimes known as the bell angles. Each of the four experiments is allowed to run for a, a reasonable period of time, and at the end we will have 16 coincidence counts, four from each of the four experiments, each noted from the coincidence monitor. Four from when the angles of the splitters were 0 and 22.5 degrees. Four from when the angles of the splitters were 0 and 67 and so on. These 16 numbers relating to the number of coincidences plus plus, plus minus, minus plus and minus minus at the different angles of the beam splitters will then be used to calculate a final number which will be used in the CHSH inequality expression bit like Bell's inequality. Now the following won't make a great deal of sense unless you read up on the CHSH inequality, but basically what is done is first to calculate four of what I will call E-values. 
each for one of the four experiments done. Here's the calculation for the first experiment with the angles of the polarization filters at A and B set at 0 and 22.5 degrees. These are the numbers in the four counters, plus, 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 minus and so on, for the experiment with the angles of the beam splitters set at 0 and 22.5 degrees. This is then done for the other three experiments, leaving us with four E values altogether, which I could call E1, E2, E3 and E4. Finally, these four E values are combined like this. And if the magnitude of this number is less than or equal to 2, then the CHSH inequality is satisfied and the hidden variable model could be valid. As you can by now imagine, this inequality is not satisfied from the results of the experiment. It is violated. The number produced from this calculation is greater than 2 indicating that the hidden variable model is not sustainable. We are once again left with the conclusion that on collapse of the state vector there appears to our classical minds to be some kind of communication within the state vector to tell the second photon what to do or if you like what to be given also that the arms of the apparatus could be extended to increase the distances involved it can be shown that that imagined communication must be greater than the speed of light, probably instantaneous. Finally, very finally, I ought to say something about the limitations and possible errors within such experiments and also point to more recent experiments which have claimed to have eliminated these objections. Perhaps the main issue over errors is counter-efficiency. Photon detectors are never 100% efficient and most experiments simply assume that a high fraction of the emitted photon pairs are detected and very few go undetected. This first sampling issue is perhaps the most dominant loophole in Bell tests. Other so-called loopholes are numerous and more subtle. For example, it was suggested that hidden variable theory could perhaps somehow fake the quantum correlations, the coincidental accounts. Perhaps hidden variables could somehow delay the detection time of each of the two particles. Perhaps the delay could vary depending on some algorithm or whatever which was carried by the particles. And perhaps this was related somehow to the detector settings that the particle meets at the detector. Now all that seems a bit bizarre to me, or more likely, I don't understand the subtlety of it. In fact, many of the suggested loopholes seem to me to be bizarre and dreamt up from vivid imaginations. Some even suggest that freedom of choice of the experimenter is compromised in some way. However, I suppose if we're going to abandon the idea of local reality in favour of quantum mechanics, which itself is bizarre, if we're going to abandon the idea that things can be predicted on the basis of what is there at a place, or the idea that they can only be influenced by signals at light speeds or less, all in favour of what seems to our classical minds to be some sort of mystical instantaneous communication of a sort which could come from the other side of the universe, if we're going to accept all the bizarre implications of quantum mechanics, then we need to be absolutely sure that any ridiculously sounding loophole can be closed. And indeed many of them have been closed. Many types of Bell tests have been done and will probably continue to be done to check more and more subtle possibilities even though the vast majority of the physics community don't need any convincing about the results of quantum mechanics and all its bizarre implications. That is until a new and better theory comes along.